Okay, I think I turned everything off. <sighs> okay, I'm recording right now. Perfect. Okay, so you were saying about your motorcycle, but you were a pretty big rider, right? Like you rode all the time? Yeah, when I lived in Seattle, I was going to x-ray school at Thema Medical Institute, and I used my motorcycle as my primary means of getting anywhere. So, uh, yeah, rode everywhere. These days, Aaron Gertler lives in Kitsap County, across the Puget Sound from Seattle. But 13 years ago, in the early months of 2008, he was still in the city, studying, working, riding bikes. There's this big motorcycle club called the Pacific Northwest Riders, and Aaron was a member. It was a good way to make friends, good excuse to drink with a bunch of people who shared your interests. One evening, at a PNW meetup, Aaron found himself sitting across from a young woman named Arpana Janaga. Arpana told Aaron she'd grown up in India and come to the Seattle area to work in tech just a few months earlier. Aaron was drawn to her right away. She was this fascinating contradiction. A biker, a volunteer at the local fire department, a dutiful daughter and older sister who never missed her daily calls with her family. If you could see someone's aura, she would have been this bright, shining beacon, always positive. Didn't matter what was going on. She would never let anything get her down. It was uh, really nice to be around her. Arpana and Aaron started spending more time together. Not that they were in a rush to get into anything serious. Arpana wasn't sure how long she'd stay in the Pacific Northwest, and Aaron was finishing up school. He was an x-ray tech so there was a chance he could be reassigned anywhere in the country. And anyway, both of them were young. And I think we were avoiding trying to label ourselves as boyfriend or girlfriend uh, because we had only been going out for a few months. But we genuinely cared for each other. And we weren't, as, well, I was not dating anyone else. We were just really enjoying the time we had together. That's all that really mattered. When Arpana told Aaron she was helping to plan a Halloween party in her apartment complex, the Valley View, she asked if he'd come and meet her non-biker friends. But he'd already told his buddies he'd go bar hopping with them in Seattle. And so I didn't go. Was she sad? She wasn't the type to get sad over someone not making plans with her. So it, it wasn't a sadness. I could tell that she definitely wanted me to go. And I, looking back, I wish I would have, but I didn't. Aaron later told police he got home around 4.30 in the morning and fell asleep. The next day, Saturday, when he didn't hear from Arpana, he was not super concerned. She'd call when she was ready. But Arpana's family back in India, they were used to hearing from her every day. And by Sunday, they were getting worried worried enough that they reached out to Arpana's two closest friends in the States, Shri Josti and Lalitha Madundi. Just yeah. before we start. Yeah, sure, uh, of course. Uh, we would not like to speak about uh, boys or booze. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The three of us okay. caught up last year by Zoom. Because so, one of the questions you mentioned asked about if she was uh, dating Aaron or something like that. So we didn't want to go into those things. Okay, it's understandable. No worries at all. Shri and Lalitha had grown up with Arpana in India, but at that point they were living in the U.S. too, although not in Seattle. That weekend, Arpana's dad called them, asking if they'd heard from her. Not for a couple days, Lalitha said. She got promoted at around that time uh, in her job. So we thought she might be busy with that work or she just had a party on Halloween, so she must be taking it slow. But we told him that we'll be contacting her and letting him know. We tried to call her mobile, tried to send an email to her office email IDs and call her office. On Monday. Yeah. yeah we didn't get any response. <laughs> So Monday morning, we used to have this uh, meeting where, uh, where she was supposed to be present 
Muhammad Ali was Arpana's boss at a nearby software company. After the meeting, I think I tried calling her on her cell and there was no answer. It went directly to voicemail. So yeah, Muhammad had no answers either. There was one other time when uh, she called, I either called in sick or was late from work, but she informed me that she was at a party or something or hanging out with people and she had too much to drink and, you know, was not feeling well after that. So in the back of my mind, I was thinking that, oh, oh no, she she had another one of those such incidents that she's probably just sleeping and when she wakes up, she's going to call. But Dr. Janaga, Arpana's dad back in India, he was getting increasingly frantic. It wasn't like he could just walk over to the Valley View and check on Arpana. So on Monday morning, three full days after he'd last heard from her, he reached out to the only other person he knew in the Seattle area, the one person he was sure would be able to help. Emergency police fire medical. Hello? Can I help? Hello? Yeah, there's this girl who's in danger. Okay, please come. Someone broke her apartment and she's totally unconscious. We're pleased to have Talkspace as our presenting sponsor. When we fall into comfortable habits instead of facing our feelings, the little things can really add up. I'm sure you've learned the hard way, like I have, that suppressing emotions generally does not end well. But needing help doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you're human. And a really great place to get that help is Talkspace Online Therapy. Talkspace offers individual and couples therapy in addition to medication prescription services. They've got thousands of licensed therapists available for you to match with, who are experts in dozens of specialties like anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. Start feeling better with a single message. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with the promo code SUSPECT. That's $100 off when you use code SUSPECT at Talkspace.com. From Campside Media and Wondery, I'm Matthew Scher, and this is Suspect. This is episode two, The Girl Upstairs. The botanical gardens in Bellevue sit atop this tall ridge overlooking the rest of the city. You cut through groves of wildflowers and fuchsia and past a small waterfall. There are stone benches to sit on, Japanese-style wooden cabins to shield you from the rain or the snow. This past summer, I drove out to the gardens to meet Jay, the person Arpana's dad had called after he had not heard from his daughter in three days. When I met Jay, he brought along his 18-year-old son, Nishant. Jay wanted Nishant to know what he'd gone through so many years before. And also, frankly, he knew how painful it would be to relive those moments. His son was his moral support. Do you remember it? I, I only heard stuff. And then I eventually found the case on the internet. We tried to keep it separate from the kids. I don't want such a bad incident uh, change the mindset of my kids on that one. I don't want him to live in this fear. Now he's 18 and he's going to college, so it's okay now, so I can tell man. So, yeah. At the time of the Halloween party in 2008, Jay was in his 30s, a successful programmer. He lived in the Seattle area, but he kept in touch with a lot of friends back home, including Dr. Janaga whose daughter had moved down the road from Jay to an apartment complex in Redmond. Very beautiful girl and uh, very brainy. And above all, she's very caring. I noticed that you speak about her in the present tense. Yes. Yeah. Three days after the costume party at the Valley View, Jay woke up, walked downstairs, checked his phone. He saw a bunch of missed calls from Arpana's dad. He called Dr. Janaga back immediately, and he could hear his friend was in a bad place. There was no sign of Arpana. 
she wasn't answering her phone. Her friends, Shri and Lalitha, couldn't get in touch with her either. Jay hung up and tried Arpana himself. Nothing. I called him back and saying that it's going to Iceman. And uh, what do you want me to do? Um, and he said, can you go and check on her? Jay had been to Arpana's place once before, but all he remembered was that you had to walk up a set of stairs to the top floor. To be honest, I don't even know that unit number. So that's why I took the steps. Then I was knocking on the wrong door. I knocked for almost like 30, 40 seconds. No one was there. Then I waited. Then again knocked. No one was reply. That's where I saw the gentleman. I don't even know who he is. The guy Jay saw coming towards him was in his mid-20s with a goatee and sideburns, average build and height. It was Cameron Johnson, Harpin's next-door neighbor. And I asked him, do you know this girl? He said, yeah, I know. So I asked him, like, where she lives. By then, me and Cameron, we both were standing just in front of that apartment. Jay pushed gently on the door, and a bolt fell off. Someone seemed to have bashed it in. The lock was broken, and there were splinters all around the jam. Then I turned to Cameron, I asked, like, hey, looks like somebody broke her apartment. What the hell is going on, right? So can you come and help me out? And he said, okay. Then we both went inside the apartment. I was yelling at her, basically. Jay was yelling, calling for Arpana, but no one was answering. The two men crossed the threshold of the apartment. Jay noticed Arpana's motorcycle helmet was on the counter, which to him at least was notable. She wouldn't have ridden her bike anywhere without a helmet. She was too careful for that. So he speculated that either her bike, which had not been in the parking lot, was in the shop, or Arpana was still in the apartment. He headed down a short hallway towards the bedroom. That's when he saw a figure lying on the floor next to the bed. Her head was faced towards the bedroom door and her legs were towards the window. And um, the body was covered with a blue towel or something. And I couldn't see her face. Um, then I did ask Cameron if he wanted to check, because I don't know the CPR, how to do the CPR. I did ask Cameron if he wanted to check if she got the pulse. He said, no, no, I don't want to touch. The whole thing, from the moment Jay and Cameron walked into the apartment to the moment they found Arpana, took no more than a minute. I immediately called 911. In fact, I initiated a call while I was in the apartment. Then I walked out of the apartment, and uh, the 911 operator having such a hard time to understand my slang and my request. When I interviewed Jay at the Botanical Gardens, I hadn't yet heard the actual 911 call. I got a copy later from the Redmond Police Department. Emergency police paramedical. Hello? Can I help you? Hello? Yeah, come here. There is this girl who's in danger. Okay, please come. It's a difficult thing to listen to. Jay's opened up a relatively safe distance from the trauma of the moment now. But back then, he was frantic, barely making sense. Oh, there is this girl fell down. Okay. And uh, someone broke her apartment and she's uh, totally unconscious. Okay, what's the address? Uh, this is, what is the address? Uh, 8946. Uh, what is the name of the apartment? Uh, Valley View. Valley View Redmond. Okay, That's Cameron you can hear in the background, by the way, trying to provide information for Jay to relay to the operator. And Jay, well, he can barely breathe. He's making this panting sound. What unit okay. number is it? And this is not close and, uh, and her, sorry. You need to calm down, okay? If she's conscious right now. A minute passes. Cameron gets on the phone himself. Hello? I can yeah. understand you a lot better, so I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? Okay. How old is this person? Uh, I think she's 24. Okay. Yeah, 24. And, and what happened? I have no idea. Is she conscious uh, right now? Uh, she doesn't look conscious, and we were yelling, and she didn't say anything. Okay. And her breathing? door looks like it's been kicked in. Okay. Is she breathing? I I don't know. I didn't even get close okay. to it. Stay in the phone. We're going to get the police department on the way, okay? Hold on. Okay. Cameron stays on the line. The operator calls over to the EMTs. 
911. Hi, Redmond, it's fire. The address is 8946 Redmond Woodenville Road, Northeast. It's called Belly View. Okay, what do you have? 24 year old female that's unconscious. The front door looks pretty kicked in. And that's all I have. Okay. All right, if you get anything else, let us know. We'll put it in as an Okay, thank you. The EMTs arrive at the Valley View, along with a handful of uniformed police officers. Jay and Cameron are told to wait outside while the police conduct a preliminary search. When they come out again, Jay can tell the news is not good. The cops, uh, one of the sergeant came and he put his hands on me and he said, I'm sorry to tell man, she's no more. And uh, uh, I was like, no, are you sure about that? That cannot be. And he was like, no, no, they did check. Um, I was kind of like arguing with him, like, uh, um, can you check again? And he was like, yeah, I'm sorry uh, they did that. And uh, uh, I, I felt throwing up means actually I, 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 I felt sick that moment. And um, uh, I, I, I thought like I'm about to collapse on that time. So I sat there, then another cop came and told me like, do you want any help or anything, paramedics help? And then I said, I, I need to sit for some time. And while he sits, Jay's phone is ringing, ringing, ringing. The caller is Dr. Janaga from his home in India. Jay doesn't answer. He just can't. Instead, he drives to the Redmond police station to give a statement. And there, an officer shows him a picture from Arpana's social media profile. The best way at that point to confirm the identity of the victim. It was such a hard thing. The, the worst part is I went back home. Then Dr. Janaga called me because by then my cousin already went and he conveyed the message. So he asked me one question. I still lingering in my uh, brain. He asked me like, is there any chance of survival? Survival. Dr. Janaga wanted to know if Arpana had a chance to live. I don't know how to answer that, basically. It was really difficult for me. I had to go through a couple of months of uh, psychiatric treatment, and I couldn't sleep. Um, it took a, um, I had to come up with a lot of willpower to get out of it. Put the microphone in your face. Just act naturally, okay? okay. My wait, are we being interviewed right now? Is that okay? We'll let the captain know before we start recording. Sounds good. Um, Thank just you know how cops don't like to be surprised. Yeah, right. Captain Brian Coates. Okay. Brian Coates is tall and lean, bald on top, graying in his temples. He's been with the Redmond Police Department for decades in a range of roles: public information officer. Beat cop, captain. I'm feeling when I retire, I can really get you know serious about cooking and stuff. Um, I'm known around here for a blackberry pie and apple pie with homemade crust. Then I would say kind of a fantasy I would have is owning my own restaurant. And I don't want to do any of the work. I just want to own it and pop in. And in 2008, Brian Coates was one of only a handful of detectives at the Redmond PD. Redmond's crime rates compared to Seattle, or even compared to other small cities in the area, they're low. In a city like Redmond, it's not all your traditional cops and robbers um, screaming lights and sirens. They're call to call all day long. It's a very quiet community. We fortunately have very little in the way of violent crime because we are more of a affluent community. Um, we focus a lot of our attention on property crime with people who are used to leaving their valuables in their car as they go to happy hour downtown and crooks come in, smash a window. It's a pretty easy payday. On November 3rd, the day Arpana's body was discovered, Coach was at home doing a crossword puzzle and drinking coffee. He heard the phone ringing and picked it up. It was his boss saying he was needed ASAP. Did not matter if it was his day off. 
I was assigned with taking a video recording of the crime scene. I had been to a couple 40-hour courses on crime scene videotography. I was familiar with our equipment that included a, a digital camera and a spotlight. He drove to the Valley View and parked his car in the parking lot, which was already filled with emergency vehicles pulled the bag of gear out of his car, and started shooting some exterior footage of the apartment complex. Every crime scene contains too much data, a wilderness of measurements, geometry, the way a body is positioned, the depression of a shoe print in the carpet. All that data may be relevant, or it may be completely extraneous. It's up to an investigator like Detective Coates to make sense of it. These investigators, and I think this has a lot to do with the popularity of crime fiction and true crime, they're storytellers. Stories informed by the facts, yes, but also of their own design. There's a book called Crime Scene Investigation, which was commissioned a couple decades ago by the Department of Justice. Lots of law enforcement agencies use it. And towards the beginning of the book, there's this crucial piece of advice. All activities conducted and observations made at the crime scene must be documented as soon as possible after the event to preserve information. And that's not just because memories erode, although they do. It's because instinct is important. First impressions are important. Which is not to say that they're everything, but they are a baseline. Sometimes your gut can change throughout the course of investigation, however, um, as new information becomes known. And you get to know the people and their past behavior and their personalities. And in this case, is one of those roller coaster rides where it's like, no, he did it for sure. No, he, for sure he did it. After shooting the outside of the apartment complex, Coates entered Arpana's unit, just like Cameron and Jay had earlier that morning, over the threshold past the splintered door frame. Right away, Coates smelled bleach. Looking down on the carpet, it was a, a light brown shade carpet, but there were a series of stained drops on the carpet that led from the living room um, all the way down the hallway. And I thought that was very unusual. The bleach formed a kind of trail. Coates followed it deeper into the apartment, recording it with his camera. There was another coat closet on the right, and then after that was a bathroom. I remember turning the camera to the bathroom and noticing that there was a large white comforter in the bathtub itself, and I could just barely make out some brownish-red stains on the comforter at that time. Um, I took a few shots inside the bathroom, then continued almost right across the hall from the bathroom was the only bedroom to the apartment. Coates found the victim in her bedroom at the foot of her bed. I have a copy of the photo of this part of the crime scene of the victim, and I don't know how else to say this. It is extremely difficult to look at. What I'll never forget was where her hands were originally located before she was turned over, there was a blue stain where each of her hands would have been. And analysis later would determine that that blue staining came from toilet bowl cleaner. Um, There was a weird looking chemical or burn on one of her arms. When the when the spotlight from my camera um, hit her body, it glistened from a oily-like substance from her waist down to her toes, um, indicated that she had been covered in some sort of a liquid. Later, Coates would learn that the liquid, at least some of it, was motor oil. Someone had also used toilet bowl cleaner and the bleach. At some point, someone had even attempted to light the carpet on fire. When I asked Coates how he was able to cope with the sheer violence of the crime scene, he kind of, I don't know, waved me off. Part of the job, he said. I don't think that makes me 
lack empathy, but it's just we're all wired differently, and that's part of the job is you see some pretty crazy stuff. As he stood in Arpana's bedroom, the part of his brain that had been trained to analyze complex crime scenes started to churn. What the hell had happened here? I think when I describe this as being a career case or a one of a kind, probably won't see again. It's when it comes down to the efforts to um, spend time with the body enough to destroy evidence that could link the person to the crime. You know, finding the toilet bowl cleaner, knowing that it's about 98% acid, um, that that would destroy, you know, enough physical evidence if she were to get a piece of the her assailant, you know, on her fingernails, that they took the time to clean her hands, finding the motor oil and knowing that that could impede our ability to collect evidence from the body. To this day, one of the most baffling parts of the scene itself was the attempt to burn either her body or the apartment down. And if you're gonna light the apartment on fire, you're gonna take out the whole complex. Coates and another Redmond detective began searching the exterior of the Valley View for more evidence. The apartment complex had only one dumpster, and it had not yet been carted off to the dump. And it was in that dumpster that Coates and his team got a break. And I remember the uh, sun had gone down at this point, and it had started raining, so it wasn't a fun job. Um, became even less fun when you were in a dumpster with uh, rotten pumpkins, dirty diapers, and the like. But it was worth the effort. We found a part of Arpana's Halloween costume, and part of that costume included a red tape. And when we pulled it out, we noticed that it too had a series of burn marks on it. The other important find in the same dumpster were some black satin sheets. And we pulled those sheets out and also noticeable on the sheets was that it had been burned. In other words, not only had someone presumably spent a lot of time in Arpana's apartment covering up evidence, but they then left the unit and taken a hell of a risk. So somebody is going up and down the stairs carrying her sheets and her costume um, and putting them in the dumpster and then presumably going back to the apartment. And nobody there ever saw that. There were a couple explanations in Coates' mind. One was that a stranger had gotten extremely lucky, committed the murder, handled the cover-up without ever being seen. The other, far more likely scenario was that the killer lived at the apartment complex, or at least attended the party, and therefore that his or her presence and actions did not attract suspicion. It was a classic whodunit with people dressed in Halloween costumes. You know, was it, was it the gangster? Was it you know, Jesus's secretary? All of those people, we didn't know them by name at the time. We knew them by what they were dressed as. Later, Coates would get a pile of photos from the Valley View, ones taken by one of the partygoers. The same embarrassing photos Rachel Shout remembered that showed everyone crammed into the pirate-themed room or the haunted forest in Arpana's unit. Coates would turn them this way and that, peering closer, looking for something he'd forgotten or missed, because somewhere in those pictures, he was sure, somewhere in the crowd, posing, smiling, a murderer had been captured on film just hours before the act. Tell me if this sounds familiar. You're feeling stressed about work, about family issues, maybe about a friendship that isn't what it used to be. And instead of talking about it or even thinking about it, you shove it down and keep yourself busy, hoping it'll just go away. And how does that usually work out for you? Look, whatever it is you're going through, suppressing your emotions isn't going to make it better. The great news is Talkspace can help. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform to help you sort through any issue. They've got thousands of licensed therapists available for you to match with, and the Talkspace app makes it easy to connect with your therapist on your schedule. Instead of waiting weeks before your next appointment, you can go anywhere and take your therapist with you. Setting up appointments with a therapist can be time-consuming, as can finding the time for the actual sessions. With Talkspace, you're doing it all online through their platform, which is really user-friendly. The last thing you need when you're trying to get care is extra stress. So I really appreciate how simple they make it. 
To match with a licensed therapist, go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with the promo code SUSPECT. That's $100 off when you use the code SUSPECT, S-U-S-P-E-C-T, at Talkspace.com. We get support from Simply Safe Home Security. When Simply Safe's founders, Chad and Eleanor Lawrence, designed their first security system in their kitchen, they did it for a very personal reason. Their friends had just had their home broken into. Making people feel safe is what they've been doing ever since that moment 15 years ago. I'm a Simply Safe customer not just because it helps me feel safer, but because their passion to protect people drives every engineering detail in their products and motivates every interaction with their customers. They make it really easy to get started. It takes about two minutes to customize a system on their website, simplysafe.com slash suspect. They've got highly trained security experts ready whenever you need them, whether that's during a fire, burglary, a medical emergency, or even just when you're setting up the system. As my listener, you can save 20% on your Simply Safe security system and get your first month free when you sign up for interactive monitoring service. Just visit simplysafe.com slash suspect to customize your system and start protecting your home and family. That's simplysafe.com slash suspect. First, there was Dr. Dunch, a doctor who killed or maimed 33 patients in Texas. And now there's a new doctor death, Dr. Paolo Maccariani the Miracle Man. Wondery's groundbreaking podcast, Dr. Death, is back for a third season with a story of trust, betrayal, and miracles. Stick around to the end of this episode to hear a preview of Dr. Death, Miracle Man. On the morning of November 3rd, a Monday, as police flooded through the Valley View, knocking on doors and looking for witnesses, Emmanuel Fair, the guy in the construction worker outfit, the guy who'd listened to CDs in the car with Cameron Johnson, he was sprawled out on the couch in a unit that belonged to his friend, Leslie. Emmanuel hadn't originally planned to spend the whole weekend at the Valley View, but Leslie had invited him to stay, which he'd done, cleaning up after the party, eating fast food, watching football with a few new friends. That Monday morning, Leslie woke Emmanuel up, tapping him to rouse him quickly. Something happened to Arpana, she said. He stared back. You know, when she first said her name, I didn't know who that was waking up, you know, and then I was like, who's that? And she said, the girl upstairs. Emmanuel stood up and pulled on some clothes. She said, there's police everywhere. And when I looked out the patio, they had the whole apartment like taped off you know and I was like damn you know so tell me um when you look outside the window and you see a bunch of police out there what did you think only thing I thought of was damn I got a fucking warrant so I probably got to talk to these people you know what I'm saying then I'm like fuck Emmanuel was scared and for good reason his warrant was tied to a probation violation which in turn was tied to a felony he pled guilty to several years earlier. Combine that with his race and his past experiences with police in Seattle, a city where law enforcement has been criticized for biased policing, and, well, you get the idea. Leslie agreed to help him stay out of sight. Once the police arrived at her door, she stepped outside, spoke to the detectives, closed the door again, and only then did she give Emmanuel the all clear. That evening, Emmanuel slipped out of the Valley View, past the assembled emergency and police vehicles. I remember when I was walking out, they had like some white truck and, you know, some people standing around and stuff. And you just kept going? Yeah. So you keep going? Uh Uh-huh. How do you get back to Seattle, Emmanuel? The same way I got out there, the bus. So yeah, Emmanuel went back to Seattle. As he did, around the same time he was riding the bus, listening to music, staring out the windows, detectives at the Redmond Police Department were still trying to make sense of the strange scene that had transpired earlier that day at the station. The scene had involved one of the men who had found Arpana's body, Cameron Johnson. 
Okay, this is Detective Brian Coates. I'm um, in an interview with Cameron Johnson. It is November 3rd, 2008 at 11.15 hours. This interview is involving case number 08-020-331. We are just off the lobby of the Redmond Public Safety Building. Um, Cameron, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. As Detective Coates interviewed Cameron, he was careful not to make it feel like an interrogation. The room they were in was just an ordinary room. No two-way mirrors, no bright light. And their talk was collegial, friendly. Coates started by asking Cameron about discovering Arpana's body. What was your first indication that something was wrong? Uh, when I saw the door. Saw the door. When it, yeah, it's just like, oh. Coates then moved on to the Halloween party. Cameron admitted he'd been at the party the previous Friday. A lot of the residents of the Valley View had. He drank a little bit, hung out at Arpana's apartment. Then he'd gone home and gone to sleep. So the last time you saw or talked to her was Friday night. Mm-hmm. So if you heard anything loud or crazy, you would probably hear it from your place, right? Yeah. My living room is against her living room. And I was sleeping on the couch that night. And I don't remember really because I had been drinking, but I think I did hear something, but I didn't, I don't know if I, I don't think I heard a loud sound, but maybe that's what woke me up. But what time was that? I don't know, I didn't, I didn't check. Coates, when I asked him about this interview, he described it as relatively straightforward. He was not a person of interest. Um, We got his statement, and he was free to return to the Valley View, which I believe he did. Still, when I listen to tape of the interrogation, I hear something else. Did you hear anything unusual during the weekend since the Halloween party? Not really. I I did actually try to get a hold of her that Saturday morning. Um, I think it was in the morning, and uh, I didn't get any. Why were you trying to get a hold of her? Just to see how she was doing. Um, what time was that? Uh, probably later in the morning. Probably maybe 10 or 11 or so. Or maybe I feel that way because I know that soon, Coates will notice some discrepancies in Cameron's story. Lots of discrepancies, in fact, if not outright mistruths. But by then, it would be too late. That's on the next episode of Suspect. Campside and Wondery, this is episode two of nine of Suspect. Suspect was reported by Eric Benson, Natalia Winkleman, and me, Matthew Scher. Eric and I are producers. David Waters is the executive producer. Our editor is Ashley Ann Krigbaum. Field production by Kyle Norris. Aliyah Papes and Callie Hitchcock are assistant producers. Fact checking by Matthew Giles. Original music by Doug Slaywin and Netta Hadari. Consulting producers are Laura Ricciardi and Josie Duffy Rice. Our engineer is Jackie Sajiko. Mixing by Jackie Sajiko, Mark McAdam, and Garrett Tiedemann. Additional production assistance from Rod Sherwood. Studio engineer is Judd Caswell at Frog Hollow Studio in Topsom, Maine. At Campside, the executive producers are me, Vanessa Gregoriadis, Josh Dean, and Adam Hoff. For Wondery, Chris Siegel is the producer. Production assistance from Fiona Pastana. Managing producer is Lata Pandya. Executive producers are George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Jen Sargent. You're about to hear a preview of Dr. Death, Miracle Man. While you're listening, make sure to follow Dr. Death, Miracle Man on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Benita Alexander had been swept off her feet by the man of her dreams. 
His nickname was the Super Surgeon. He'd flown her all around the world. The typical beautiful hotel, the, the beautiful dinners. But something was wrong. I started having horrible pain. She'd had an unrelated surgery just six weeks earlier, and now the wound was infected. They made it back to their hotel room. And he gets my travel scissors. Paolo looked into her eyes. And he said, do you trust me? And I just nodded my head. And he took those scissors and he plunged them into my incision. Benita Alexander trusted Paolo. Whoever said love is blind wasn't kidding. Fellow surgeons trusted Paolo. This was like, you know, a rock star that asked me if I wanted to come and join them uh, backstage. And he would betray them all. Who is this man? The man I thought I was about to marry doesn't exist. And we saw more and more lies. So this guy has been doing experiments on human beings without ethical approval. Follow Dr. Death Season 3, Miracle Man, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now.